I would like to welcome you all to this webinar. It's on managing your cash to build financial resilience. So I hope everyone who's joined us is intending to be here. Um, like I'll be moderating a wonderful panel of experts who have generously given us their time to answer some of our questions today. Um, my name is Nena Onuba. I'm a CW member and I'm the founder of LBB Skincare. Um, it's a brand that I actually started after struggling to find effective skincare on the go as an investment banker who was living in London. Um, from this, it tells you that I'm really a problem solver, um, which is also why I'm grateful to um, Sally and her team at the CW for giving us this platform to come together and really just discuss something that is quite pressing on, I think, any beauty brand owners' minds at this unprecedented time that we find ourselves in. Um, I'm really excited to be joined by a wonderful panelists and I'm just going to introduce you to them really quickly and you'll get a chance to hear from them in their own words. So we have Andy. Andy Hodgetts is a senior manager in the corporate finance team of Buzzercut, the um, accounting firm. He specializes in, advance, in advising entrepreneurial businesses on financing, mergers and acquisitions, and um, prior to Buzzercut, Andy led the finance function of a high growth business where he helped them raise over $100 million. Um, it's just fantastic <laughs> to hear, I'm sure, for many of us. Um, and then we have Amy. Amy is a senior investment manager in the private equity and VC team at Foresight Group, an investment firm. Amy sits on the board of seven companies and makes growth capital and buyout investments across a wide um, spectrum of sectors. Um, they typically invest between one to five million pounds. Um, and what's also helpful is that from a prior um, time, Amy also has retail sector expertise. Um, and then finally, we have David. David Martin is a partner at the corporate team of the West End law, law firm of SMB. Um, David helps startups and scale-ups complete fundraisings, drawdowns on loans, and to navigate corporate recovery, um, which is really so important, um, or at least it will be very important when we see how this whole um, window, this whole pandemic pans out. Um, David acts for health and beauty brands, including Moms and You, my beauty brand, Lisa Elridge, and Nita Wellness. I'd like to say welcome to you guys. It's, a, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, and just before we kick off, I think the team at CW, CW are really efficient. So everyone should be plugged in. Um, and let me see what's coming through on the chat. So, hi. If you have a look, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And that's where we'll be looking to see any questions you want to put to us. So the structure is I'm going to kick off with asking a few questions that we've received so far to our panelists and then really open it up for the audience. I think um, this is going to be the most useful if it's interactive and we can really um, get your questions live. So um, let me kick off. So um, guys on the panel, um, you guys have a wide breadth of visibility that some of us don't have, you know, looking after our own businesses. And the disruption that this pandemic has caused has affected beauty businesses um, in particular. You know, with the lockdown and shops being shut, beauty businesses are where we're concerned. And I would just like to know, you know, three to five minutes overview highlights on what you're seeing from working with your clients and different portfolio companies. Um, if we could start with you, Andy. Yeah, sure. So um, I think it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride over the last few weeks of what we've seen. Um, I think from speaking to, to clients and contacts around the place, um, obviously a bit of a shock and a lot of people spent the first couple of weeks probably um, very internally focused, um, considering what their options and what the impact would be on the business. Um, I do think the government measures have uh, helped calm a lot of people down and and kind of allow them to take a little bit more stock of what's going on. So people are you know spending a lot of time understanding those, getting to the bottom of them over the last few weeks. I think we've seen a shift, perhaps probably from two weeks ago, where a lot of our clients and um, businesses we've been speaking to for a while have started to become a little bit more forward thinking. Um, 
maybe you know I, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty out there but feeling a bit more comfortable because the government support around their cash flow in the immediate future and actually starting to think about the opportunities that arise coming out of the back of this so you know, to give a couple of direct examples um i've had uh two clients come to me over the the course of the last week who have been saying actually might now might be a good time to make acquisitions and and been having conversations about how can they enact on that going forward um we've had other clients who've been thinking about saying i've been meaning to put in a emi scheme for my employees for a long period of time actually i might do that now because i might not be able to pay people cash bonuses to reward them for their work then maybe actually i can give them some options and incentivize them into the into the business that way because there's no cash cost for me right now and i'll do an emi scheme or something like that so i think we move beyond the immediate firefighting and people are more into a bit more of a I wouldn't say it's full strategic yet, yeah, but a little bit more perhaps tactical is the, the better word of what they can do going forward. Um, you know, it's it's also for businesses, um, there are new things popping up all the time. Um, something we'll probably talk about a bit later on is very recent announcement. The um, uh, the government's basically convertible loan scheme is called it the Future Fund, um, which will do some matching as well. That's something that's been announced in the last few days as an example. We're still seeing lots of refinements from from how the banks are treating the, the civils loan scheme. So um, I think there's a lot still changing that entrepreneurs are getting a grip with, but I think it is more stable than say if we've been having this conversation four weeks ago. Okay, thank you, um, Amy. I think I'd agree with a lot of what Andy's just said in terms of the sort of stages of how this progresses, and it feels to us like we're at the we're at the end of the beginning now. Um, so that the panic is sort of finished to some extent. Um, our, the mindset is certainly lifted into, okay, now how do we need to change our strategy to best take advantage of potential opportunities that might be popping up? Um, how do we, in more immediate term, how do we get people back to work into offices with the correct social distancing, the correct you know, practical things like enough cleaning products, et cetera, so if we're going to come back to working semi-normally, how are we actually going to do that? Um, I don't think the beauty industry is particularly different than many others in lots of ways. So there's a lot of supply chain disruption still going on. Although China is back to work pretty much full time, there's still significant delays. And we're seeing quite a lot of product trapped in sort of uh, in countries around the world globally where there's, there's problems with shipping or lockdowns in various countries so that's a real problem for companies who've got short shelf life products longer shelf life is probably a little bit more immune to it but you've still got issues and if you don't have the product in the uk um, or wherever it is that you're selling you can't sell it so yeah. um, i think people are starting to worry a little bit about about that and when you do manage to find a new opportunity which is still possible in these in these times by perhaps thinking about new channels you can't service it if you don't have the stock. So there's a lot of focus on that and potentially looking at new suppliers as well, onshoring instead of offshoring just for emergencies. Um, I think some, some brands are doing quite good work in terms of opportunistically, I hate to say taking advantage, but taking advantage of the situation to drive some PR. There's been a lot of, especially in the beauty sector, a lot of good work being done around uh, you know, giveaways to NHS workers, flipping to making hand sanitizer, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Line between looking crass and, um, you know, shouting about your um, wonderful credentials too much. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it helps lift, um, you know, brand sort of publicity really. Um, and why not at this time? Mm -hmm. um, I think there'll be longer term changes to consumer behavior, which we can come on to talk about. And I think some brands are now starting to think about how do we how do we take advantage of that and how do we shift our, our product range and our route to market because clearly any brand at the moment with a food retail channel so if you're somehow supplied through tesco or any of the big retailers you should be well insulated from the worst of these pandemic impacts and of course direct consumer online is also somewhat insulated um, so i think people going forward will have to think much more about those channels and how you compete in an increasingly competitive world for those channels and, and just before I bring on um, David, but Amy, just sticking with you, because you're the investor on our panel, how has the sort of investor outlook been affected by this pandemic? Um, 
well in this in the scale up world which is where most of our funds invest yeah there there has been a little bit of a hiatus because of course we had to focus on our portfolio and just to make sure that they're all in as good a shape as they could be but yeah. period but we're now 30 days exactly i think into lockdown um and so all the immediate actions have been taken there there is plenty of money out there and certainly you know, we we're sitting on lots of cash most of our funds are tax advantaged for the end investors um, a lot of them are retail funds where anyone can you know buy a slice of our fund and there are certain rules that compel us to spend that money within certain periods of time so we we can't just sit on the money for a year and do nothing we have to we have to get out there um, so we're absolutely open for business we are cracking on with investments i would say nearly as normal i think things will be a little bit slower through investment committee and there probably will be an impact on valuations but it you know stuff's going ahead and the likes of andy in corporate finance and david in in the league on the legal side there's a lot of these people who currently don't have live deals this is a great opportunity to to talk to them because they want they want work <laughs> Um, and there is investment to to happen so i would say yeah crack on with it that's really encouraging to hear and we're going to come back into a little and delve a little bit deeper as to exactly what investors are looking for but let's hear from david quickly so david i know that you advise a number of beauty businesses and so i'm sure we spoke already and you've told me how you're spending time with them it'd be lovely to just hear your insights on what is happening in beauty and what you're seeing with your clients yeah, so I would I would definitely echo what Andy and, and Amy have said about kind of people have got over the initial shock. They're starting to to take time to, to think more about the future. We've certainly seen seen some deals fall over. We've seen the pricing in some deals uh, revise downwards. There's definitely a flight to quality. Uh, investors are are less willing to to take risks than they were. A month or two ago but we are still seeing deals progressing we're still seeing new deals come in and a lot of our clients are also looking at you know how can they reduce costs how can they you know generate cash flow to kind of weather uh, you know the coming storm there have been some particular challenges out there a lot of our uh, health and beauty clients are direct to consumer. Uh, they've had some logistics challenges. Uh, some of our clients who are, you know, listed in the multiples uh, and, you know, the big pharmacy chains like Boots have found themselves being delisted uh, mm -hmm. because they were seen as a kind of non-core brand. And those retailers have been choosing to kind of focus on, you know, what they see as their biggest sellers so that they can focus their staff of, of getting stock on on the shelf and that's had a, a been a bit of an upset for for some of our clients uh, in terms of outlook in in the short term i think a, a lot of our clients are thinking you know these kind of new areas that we might have moving in been moving into businesses that the areas of the business that we might have been launching we're going to hold off on and we're kind of you know focusing on retrenching a bit and making sure that you know we survive the next few months and when the recovery begins and it will begin we're in the best possible position to to, to move then sure that that's really helpful to know so look i think it's a good time to sort of get into the meat of some of the you know high level questions this this webinar is titled managing your cash to build financial resilience during this pandemic um, and i think just off the bat a lot of us beauty businesses have seen chunks of our revenue being slashed off and the question people are asking is look you, i i heard you david talk about cost saving where can i go where are those easy places that i can go to for cash from my business, looking at what I already have, I, um, you know, what's on my balance sheet, how do I deal with my suppliers, how do I just raise more liquidity for my business in this period? Um, maybe I'll start with um, Andy. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're actually we were chatting yesterday, and the, yeah. there's the, the actually the best source of um, cash for a lot of businesses. Yeah. Uh, 
is is lying in your own balance sheet and your own operations and i think that often gets overlooked so you know it's it may be not optimal times right now to to be able to liquidate a lot of stock into cash but you know we are seeing a, a, a number of our clients that are in the, the beauty and fashion sectors who are running sale promotions because, again, you've got costs, stock that might be sat a cost on your balance sheet. Sorry, boring accounting in me now coming out, but that's sat on cost. Even if you're taking a 50% cut on that, you're still going to turn that into, into cash at a, at a profit potentially. Um, and therefore, to be able to do that in a, in a quick, easy manner is cash in the door. Um, now, now it's actually it's easier for me to say that than in reality it actually necessarily happened um so that's where other funding lines can come into place so again it's it's always worth starting looking where you've got something that there's value locked up in the business so if you're you're dealing with wholesale it might be invoices so be able to get invoice finance to help accelerate the payment of those um there could be stock and asset finance that could be taken to um uh basically the stock you can't liquidate yourselves um, to be able to leverage against that and somebody will lend against it. Um, there's also certain products. There's a, there's a lender called Trade River, for example, that will... Um, and some banks Sorry, can you well. repeat that? I yeah, there's a, there's a lender called Trade, Trade River, as an example, but some of the banks do this as well, um, who will extend out supplier payments. Um, you, know, you, you can put some of these elements together. You can't necessarily put them all together because the, the kind of stretch on the business would be too much. You can put some of those elements together to try and um, accelerate out what can uh, you know what cash can be can be taken. You know, there's a lot of the standard government. I'm not going to go into all of them, but the government support that's out there, um, following of staff, for example. But even things as simple as rates. You know, a trick there um, is that uh, if you're in a business that actually doesn't have necessarily its own premises, but might be in a, a WeWork or a shared office type location, those landlords can still take the rate claims. Um, from the councils to actually have a conversation with your with your landlord about saying I know you've got the potential to take these rate claims I want to have a, a proportion of my mine back because otherwise they're just sitting on that themselves so being able to do certain things like that or even talk about deferring of payments you know with suppliers are a good example um, a lot of our clients are, are actually working out the suppliers they want to work with going forward because they've got those that are being very accommodating and saying, yeah, look, we'll go on a payment plan. We all understand we're in this together. Let's work out something that works for both of us. And those that are firmly demanding payment tomorrow. And a lot of them actually, if we're being honest, uh, uh, are saying the ones that I've, I'm seeing people through colors. And if the ones that are demanding payment tomorrow, I'm not sure I'm gonna keep working with them going forward. So have the conversation and try and have it in a constructive manner with your with your suppliers. They're in the same boat as you are, but hopefully you can come to something that works for everyone. So I think it's working, uh, through all those options as, as much as possible. No, thanks, that's really helpful because you touched on some, I think very, we, we spoke quickly, but important areas that I think brand owners wanna to listen to. There's value in your debtors. So you can raise some financing against your invoices. Um, and look, we can't delve into all of these methods of financing in a lot of detail, but I think it's worth just noting them. So at least you can go away and look at that. You talked about, um, being i think and amy you're going to hear this being brave in those supplier conversations and negotiations everyone is stressed right now and i think it's absolutely important and i think how did you call it we can't afford to be british and shy <laughs> you've, got to, <laughs> you've got to ask for what you want and it allows me to very quickly flip to amy because i know that amy you don't just do deals you actually sit with the companies and you have a lot of portfolio businesses that you're working with perhaps you could talk us through some of these really practical easy low-hanging fruit financing options that businesses can be thinking about that you're employing i think amy's on mute oh you're on mute carrie that's better no that's cool i'm out i'm okay. out please um yeah, so no, no, we were talking earlier about yeah, not being too British about asking for, for help, really, yeah. uh, when it comes to payments. And particularly, we, we're taking quite a tough um, stance on rental payments within our portfolio. So I would say most of our portfolio are, are in premises who are, where the landlord probably doesn't rely on the income of the rent to feed their children. And we are, we're taking the approach 
our number one ask is for a six month rental holiday. So not a deferral, but a, just a, you know, a break in rent for six months as the starting point of negotiations. Mm. You'll probably get beaten back to, but you might get beaten back to a three month rental holiday. And even that is great. A lot of people are not in their offices. You're not using that space. So I think you've got a perfectly rational reason to, to ask for a bit of a holiday there. The other thing to you perhaps suggest on, on rent is to link it to revenue. And then you can therefore, you have, again, perfectly valid um, reason to, uh, to negotiate a much lower rent. And you can then eke it up as your business hopefully comes back with the recovery. Outside of rent, um, other things we've done across our whole portfolio are to cancel all direct debits. So we're not saying don't pay them, um, because some of those direct debits will be really important um, suppliers for your business. But it means that whoever's looking at finance eyeballs every single penny that leaves the account. Mm. And it's amazing sometimes how much you discover you've got in direct debits, things like magazine subscriptions that you may have forgotten you owned and might even be a hard copy magazine being delivered to your office where no one is um, the you know the pennies can mount up into pounds when you when you start taking a really close look at things like that the furlough scheme clearly um, well, I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about the government measures but we are using the furlough scheme very widely it's actually quite flexible in terms of things you can do we've also discussed um, pay, sort of voluntary pay reductions across the board for some some of our companies where there's only perhaps four days a week of work, but we don't want to furlough everyone or, or we don't want to furlough 20% of the people. We'd rather have everybody on a lower level. I think the important thing there is treating your employees and staff as, as people and humans. You don't impose this sort of thing. If you can bring them on the journey and explain that we're all in it together. One of my companies, I think, has done a cracking job of it, actually. They've, they've just done a survey where they were rated 4.9 out of 5 for their approach to the pandemic. And um, one of the things they've been doing, it might seem like a small thing, but every Friday, they buy everyone in the company like a, a slab of beers. So the fact that a lot of them are furloughed or on reduced salaries, actually, they're still getting a cracking write-up from their employees because of what is a seemingly quite small thing, but it, it helps to bring everyone on that on that journey um, the last thing i would say is another bit of a little trick um, for getting some cash is to bring forward your financial year end mm. then um, put in an r d tax credit claim if you can um, you can claim two years back and and if you are a company who has the opportunity to make a reasonable claim um, you currently hmrc kind of miraculously are actually operating quite efficiently on the R&D tax credit scheme and, and they're paying out within about 28 days and they're not offsetting it against arrears um, currently, arrears on PAYE or NI or VAT or anything else that you might not be paying. Um, you should just get the money on your R&D tax credit claim. So that's a bit of a, a trick as well to just show up your, your cash in the short term. That's in incredibly helpful. And um, David, um, I do, do you have anything to add to that subject? Uh, not, not a massive amount of detail. I guess I would just add on the kind of paying of rent. The, the government yeah. has said commercial tenants can't be evicted uh, for a period of time. So several of our clients are having difficult conversations with their landlords. Uh, Unfortunately, they tend to be central London landlords who are not known for being particularly generous or cuddly. Uh, and a lot of them are pushing back and saying, you know, maybe they'll defer rent, but they, you know, they're, they're not granting uh, rental uh, holiday, holidays or waiving any rent. But at least it can help you stretch your cash flow if if you haven't had to make the last quarter payment and you know that you're not going to be kicked out of those premises provided that you can you know make it before you know we come out of this this lockdown okay fantastic I think, can i just just quickly add two yeah. quick things of I, I think i think most people are aware and have done it but i just want to re-stress to everyone that um you know to, to amy's point there that making sure everyone isn't making HMRC payments at the moment for, for VAT, AYE, you know, notify them, don't just not make it, but they're, they've actually come out and officially said that they're, they're being supportive of this and the, the practices that Amy mentioned earlier, 
are being um, and also on the R&D point for, for anyone who's a beauty business and, and not thought about it there is a potential of making R&D claims you have to be doing something um, where there's there's an unknown um, but for example our R&D director I was having a chat with him yesterday he's worked with um, with Lush and Neil's Yard as examples and you know if I give a more practical example of to get people thinking but you know it, it might be a, a situation where if you're if you come up with a new formulation you've got issues with you know, oils and water separating out and you're trying to come up with new new ways you're trying different um agents within that to, to make it all work um actually that is a potentially qualifying claim so there are opportunities that people sometimes don't acknowledge um i think a lot of people think of r d and they think of technology businesses or engineering businesses um but actually if you're doing something where there's a known and uncertainty there's possibilities for, for beauty businesses to be able to claim that, that's really helpful to know and it's this sort of practical advice that I was hoping we would get and so I'm elated to be hearing all of these handy tips and I hope everyone listening has their notepads out and is jutting furiously. So HMRC is basically the point of call for a number of these, um, especially with R&D tax credits, right? That's probably your yeah. starting place. Yeah. Very good. Um, so let's move on. So we've just talked about that. I'm pleased because I had development capital. Let's see how much time do we have. Um, Okay, we're at about half point. I haven't seen any new questions pop up, so I will just shoot on. But if anyone in the audience has questions, just put it in the Q&A, and every so often I will look through and pick those questions. So let's come on to then um, equity. Um, I know that a lot of, you know, we have probably a wide range of businesses that are here today um, from early to probably more mature. Um, what are those sources of, equity funding that people can look at now. I know we started the call with Amy saying that, look, there is capital um, to deploy. I think what I'd like to hear is what investors are looking for quality wise with businesses, but also where are the sources of capital for different businesses? So from early stage businesses to probably, you know, um, the more distressed end of things. It'd just be good to get that spread. And I'm, I'm relaxed, any, okay, you guys, are, who do I start with? Maybe I start with David because <laughs> start there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in terms of equity, you know, one thing I always say to, to to clients is once you've closed the funding round, don't don't forget your investors. It's worth spending a bit of time on investor relations, giving them updates, telling them how you're doing, making them feel loved, so that when you come back to them to potentially tap them up for some more support they feel well disposed towards you. And I think one thing we're seeing in, in the current market is where our investors are looking for a bit of a, a cushion to help them through the next uh, few months, whether that's equity or debt, they're finding it a lot easier to access that from their existing shareholders or their existing bank where there's already a relationship. Uh, and I think some of that, you know, exactly as, as Amy said, and it's the same with the banks that we deal with, you know, they're suddenly inundated with all of their portfolio companies, all of their customers, you know, wanting help at the same time. And of course, they're going to prioritize their existing relationships. So I think there is new money there to be, be found. We're working on several investments at the moment where it's a completely new in investor but those deals will always take longer uh, to get cash into the door and be harder than where you've already got someone who knows you has been through due diligence you know you probably negotiated all of the documents you need with them already so it's, it's a much simpler and quicker process that, that's helpful that's really important start with the people who know you well and andy i can see you edging to say something uh, no, I'm happy to do it. I mean, I, I'd say right now, my if we go very high level. Yeah. Um, my view is that you know, going and talking to somebody like Amy to take some capital right now is 100% the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, um, there is a question around of are you going to get the best valuation? But actually, my my view is it if you get the the money that will a help you ride through the, the all the issues that are going on right now, but more importantly has something in the bank account for you to take advantage of opportunities. I think we're all, everyone's aligned and everyone I speak to agrees that because the world's changed, change creates opportunities and therefore 
the businesses that are most agile but also have funding to go on and chase those opportunities are probably going to do best and therefore even if you are maybe going to have a uh, uh, have a hit on valuation right now actually the outperformance by taking that capital might help balance it out in the in the longer term so um i, I think 100 percent, you know looking to take equity is is a sensible move right now um unfortunately you know there are there are people like foresight that are lending and um, that are investing in but there is probably less capital and it's probably disproportionately hit more at the earlier stage now I'll put a caveat out there i i don't advise early stage businesses that are going after angels so i'm not as as into and as as on the ball with that market but i would say that you know uh, uh angels are are less prevalent than they were right now um but to david's point if you've already got angels in there they're a good they're going to be looking to support their existing investments before going and chasing new ones um the but still worth going to talk to people like angel syndicates if you're very early stage there are still things you know i've got an email from virgin startup loans that offer loans for, for people founding businesses they're still saying that they're putting money out the door as an example it's twenty five thousand pounds so if you're more mature it's not going to, to 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 make a world of difference but if you're looking if you're very early stage and starting out your business that's helpful when you start to get up to um the size of business that, that amy and her peers are looking at that capital definitely is still available. Um, you know, Amy will talk about this more probably in a, in, a, in a bit, but you know, people who have formal funds are the best place to go because they've got money they can draw down and access. When you're talking to, there are some out there who don't have formal funds um, and that's the same with, with angels. They don't have as ready access to the capital. So probably a question I'd always encourage right now is, do you have a fund and do you have actually access to the money that you're going to deploy uh, or are you relying on another pool of investors that need to sign up? So I'd always have that as a question. Okay. Um, and, and just, I'm looking at the chat and I can see some questions. We'll come back to the R&D tax credits. I've seen it, but um, perhaps we've had a question. Crowdfunding, especially at this time, always seems like a good idea. Um, and I know for lots of reasons. So maybe Amy, you can talk to us a little bit about some of these alternative sources of funding like crowdfunding and how they work and what people should really think about. Yeah, and, and also I think Andy will probably have some, some good points here because he'll be yeah. more, more of the sort of breadth of opportunities than I will. Um, crowdfunding, from what I've seen so far, um, on the Crowdcube website, they pretty much say, look, it's going to take a long time. We're going to um, uh, sort of, there's a, there's a few sort of carve outs from their normal process. So it sounds like they're gearing up to not expect to be, you know, money to be flowing particularly rapidly during this period. That makes complete sense to me in that the, the, the crowd, if you like, are combined, well, it's a combination of people who already know your business, usually you have to go and find your own crowd for most of these sites plus some sort of generic high net worth investors or even low net worth investors who are just interested in new products the problem is that no one has any spare cash or if you do have spare cash you're too scared to spend it because no one knows what we're going into we don't know if the medium and long term is going to be a really sustained very deep recession a a short but deep recession a medium long a w shape with a second lockdown no one has got a crystal ball and so i suspect making small investments into new companies is not unlikely to be at the top of many sort of hobby investors agenda so i suspect in terms of just the availability of the cash crowd people and the other crowd funders will probably be quite tricky at the moment yeah but i'll be in Andrew, um, do you want to? yeah, yeah. And, and i think on on that the the trick that most people don't realize about crowdfunding is that you need to have secured a significant chunk of the money before you go to the platforms um, that they, they kind of do a self-selection so a lot of people think oh look i need four hundred thousand pounds i'll go to the crowd queue because it'll be easy and the crowd will give me the money you need to generally on the whole and centuries do vary but have at least half of that secured so it's not a magic bullet you know it, it in normal times it can be a good source of top up um because if i'm honest the crowd generally isn't sophisticated as somebody like amy in terms of what they'll look at and therefore you can perhaps go and, and raise more money than than the stage you're at so it can have some some positive effects on that side of things i agree with amy i think right now if you think of if you think of your own personal finances 
most people aren't making that big investment decision, whether that's you know making an actual investment or whether it's just buying a car or something right now, because nobody's yeah. quite sure what's going to happen. Um, so, and it's the same with it's the same with um, the high net worths who, who might be able to write checks for tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds. A, a lot of them are, are thinking about their own money at the moment and, and just holding it while they until we you know. I think it will change when we have more positive movements and we start going back to normal. But right now, people are probably still a little bit scared. Yeah, and I think one thing I would just add in terms of when the recovery comes, uh, looking again at, at crowdfunding for a health and beauty brand, you may well have a database already of you know several thousand fans of the product and crowdfunding can be quite useful from a kind of consumer engagement people like feeling that they own part of the products that that they're buying uh, but certainly our experience even in a better market was you know our clients weren't able to raise large sums on the platforms maybe it was good for that final slice when they'd raised half already or or, or more to get to their target uh, but it, it was never going to be all of the answer Fabulous, thank you. So we've had a few questions coming in and I'm just gonna go through them. Um, so let me just, here we go. Okay, so the first question I have here is, um, do I have to have applied to R&D tax credits in advance to make a claim? Uh, I'm happy to say that. Uh, no, no, you don't. Um, there are actually some providers, if you have made claims that will um, loan against an R&D claim and basically accelerate the, the payment of that um but on the whole you need to have had a fairly large claim you need to have had you know 50 to 100 thousand pound plus claim and have made that claim previously to be able to take the loan but if you're just looking to make the claim for the first time um no you don't need to have ever claimed it before um and you can as amy was saying you can go back periods as well to be able to claim for previous periods but what you need to do is you need to have um the basis of why you're doing something uncertain um and uh, the details of what all the costs of those are and, and allocate those to be able to submit something to HMRC. Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, I'm not an R&D expert, I'll make that very clear, but um, we've got an R&D director at, at my um, my company, so if anyone's got any questions, he's always quite happy to have a conversation and um, just guide people where he thinks there even is a claim there in the first point. Okay, um, that's helpful. And I think the second question that I've had here is one I was going to raise actually is, what are the, it's back to early stage businesses and really what the sources of, if you've done seed round, you're probably below the 1 million mark, Amy, that you'd be investing in. So people stuck in that middle, where are the places that they can realistically go to for equity capital or even just capital full stop? I think at this stage, you'll take anything, right? Um, who wants to go? I'll, I'll do, I'll, I'll start. We, we do actually have our, some funds that will invest, um, at the earlier stage. So we run a couple of, of impact funds. Um, that The ones we run are essentially part of the government scheme um, with the underlying funding coming from the British Business Bank. Uh, and they're targeted on specific geographies in the UK. So we happen to run the one for the East Midlands and for Scotland, but there are other, um, other sort of versions of it targeting other regions all around the UK. You don't have to be in that region right now as long as you're happy to set up in that region and those pots of money are absolutely designed to invest in that awkward gap between the friends and family round mm. and, and when the sort of more institutional vct type cash kicks in so if you if you've got revenue of somewhere between you know 100k and 2 million you you often find yourself in this awkward gap where if you don't have particularly friend, wealthy friends and family it's it, yeah. it is a tricky position to be in if you need to raise say 500k 750 it's well recognized that that is a problem hence the government set up these schemes to try and fill that gap so i would investigate those um the midlands engine is the one we do there's also the northern powerhouse and they've all got various names they do equity funding and debt funding some will be for complete startups some will be for slightly later stage businesses but there are pots of capital out there you just have to kind of look a bit harder i think plus i wouldn't hold back from just good old-fashioned linkedin stalking of high net worths in in particular areas send them a really like flattering obsequious email 
tell them how much you admire what they've done in their business and ask for a bit of money. You know, there's a, there's a lot of wealthy people out there who actually really enjoy the sort of nurturing and helping element of, of angel investing. And, and some of them have got a lot of cash to spend and actually can be really beneficial to your business, especially if they've got industry knowledge and connections. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too shy and British again about asking for, for investment. Yeah. And, and I'd, I'd add, add on that actually the, the advantage that, that everyone who's, who's in the beauty sector have is it's an interesting sector and it's mm. something that, uh, you know, I don't want to um, uh, demean anything at all, but, but you know, it's a good trophy for somebody who's wealthy. A number of fashion beauty clients I've got have got you know, very wealthy backers behind them who are just very interested in the product and are interested in the sector. And it's, if I'm honest, something sexy. Whereas if you're a manufacturing business making nuts and bolts, you're probably going to not get that same level of attention. So as Amy said, you know, there isn't a trick. It's, it's the same as trying to sell and create interest. But even try, you know, maybe right now, posting out a sample. To, to some people who you think could be potentially um, investors who might be people who have been successful in the, the beauty and fashion sectors before saying, oh, please try this if you're interested. I'm looking for investment right now. And if they love your product, they might actually, you know, pick up the phone and have a conversation with you. There, there isn't magic with it. The bit I would say is um, uh, do, do have a look for also angel syndicates. As I said, I think angels are being a bit less active right now. But syndicates are always a good way in because they're a group of angels that act together. So you get access rather than having to deal with people one by one. You get access to deal with people in a in a more you know holistic basis. So um, they can be worth. And again, um, Amy mentioned it. There's regional ones. There are ones targeted to different sectors. There's no magic. Just Google and and search as much as you can. Which which is helpful. And 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 probably one other bit I'm going to add here is even when taking friends and family money. It's really helpful even for the potential investors to do it through tax efficient schemes. If you're as a business qualified as an EIS, you know, your investors get a tax break, which is money in their account. So they're even probably able to give you slightly more. And I think that's one that's easily overlooked. Um, I'm just going to go on to another question that we have here. Um, does anyone have any tips for shopping for invoice finance? Would this normally come from your bank or other partners? Uh, a number of the main high street banks offer invoice uh, discounting or invoice finance and sometimes through a different subsidiary. So people like HSBC HS, or, or Lloyd's uh, all have products. And I would say in the current market, if you have a you know, relationship with a bank, speak to them first. That's likely to get you to the top of the queue. All lenders are dealing with kind of unprecedented levels of demand at the moment and there's a lot of specialist uh, invoice discounters and invoice funders out there that, that you can speak to and sometimes they're willing to be a bit more creative in in some of the solutions that they can can offer you okay yeah i would say there's also there's two different kinds you can either get a sort of whole book invoice financing arrangement which for smaller companies may not be as sort of flexible and useful. It's also, it becomes a bit like a sort of addictive drug. It's quite hard to get off it once you're sort of in, used to invoicing, invoice discounting everything you get. Um, so in this particular situation, it might be worth looking at the sort of individual spot invoice discounters who will literally take one particular invoice. You can choose which ones you want to do. So if you, for example, got an invoice from Tesco and Tesco are helpfully telling you that they'll pay you on 120 20 days if you're lucky, Actually, um, especially for the bigger, more blue chip um, customers, those invoices are quite, they're discountable, if you like, because they're nice and certain, they're just very long. Uh, and doing it on a spot basis might work better for, for smaller companies. That's really helpful. And are there one or two names just to kick, kick us off that are familiar? I know you've mentioned banks already. It's, it's, it's okay. We can there's, yeah, no, there's, a, there's a few out there. I mean, yeah. there's, there's, as I said, all the high, you know, all the high street banks will do it. Um, you, you get, I'd, I'd stay clear of um, big names, uh, people like Bibby that people might have heard of. Generally, um, clients who, who come to us looking for, for larger invoice finance lines are looking to move away from somebody like that. Um, but there's a number of niche players. There's people like um, Market Invoice. Um, there's people like Archover who 
um, uh, a bit more, a bit smaller. Usually, it's a bit the same as anything. You, you you pay a bit more to get flexibility or a bit more of a stretch on what people look at. So it's worth considering that if if people are offering you more than you think you can get, probably it's going to come at a cost. But that's the trade-off you need to make. And um, yeah, you know, market invoice arch over people we've seen have, have worked quite well with people before. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, I'm just going to go through the, there's one last question here. Do you anticipate heightened caution as an investor when it comes to indie brands? What should we be doing to break through? Perhaps, Amy, I think this is for you. Um, I don't know about heightened caution necessarily. I, I do sort of, I mean, I could say there's a flight to quality. That's kind of true, but I'd like to think we're looking for quality all the time. Um, it's, it's certainly true that we, we don't want to be backing businesses that we think are just milking the very short term um, sort of pandemic boom. So we're unlikely to invest in any hand sanitizer company, for example, that is got a crazy valuation just on the back of the current situation. But we will be looking for companies who, um, whose products play into what we expect to be the long term changes. So I, I mean, it's just guesswork at this stage, but I think you, you've got to assume that actually there will be more of a focus on, on personal hygiene, particularly. And, and, you know, I'm certainly realizing even just personally, I realize how much just stuff I touch when I leave the house. And I never really thought about that before. So I think we're all becoming sort of slightly more OCD. But I think brands that kind of play into hygiene and personal wellness, home self-care, of course, as well. I think there's a lot of people who have, have got used to now doing doing their nails doing whatever it is at home instead of just popping to the local um local nail salon that may persist as something of a long-term trend but it doesn't as we discussed earlier then it kind of depends how long a recession we get off the back of this whether people have got the disposable cash to be popping back out for their weekly manicure or not so we, we want to see businesses that are going to play into long-term trends, not just short-term taking advantage of the current situation. Um, I, think, I think that's it really, but our normal yeah. way we apply, we like customer diversification, we like recurring revenues, we like strong brands playing into long-term um, trends, and we like strong teams. I, I mean, a good team will make a bad product work and vice versa, unfortunately. That, that really takes me back. I, I think every private equity team I speak to is like, it's all about the team. If you have good people, they can make it's it. It's such a cliche, but it's like, it's 100% true. And you, you really feel it when you get a bad one. Um, and you realise quite how, uh, quite what a difference it makes to have a really good, positive, you know, hardworking, experienced team. It's completely life changing. Yeah, and I would just add to that also for the indie brand question. I think an important thing that investors want to see also is how the business is going to scale. You know, so you might be small today. If you can show me that story on how we can grow together, it just makes your equity story that much more attractive. And I think that's true irrespective of what happens. Yeah. Actually, sorry, one point to mention as well, I should have said is make life easy for the investor by do your work on your modeling. We completely, we completely accept that no one can predict the future. But if you, if you approach us and say, look, I've got three models here. I've got a, a blue sky base case and a black sky scenario based on whatever it is, a, a W further lockdown in December and then a long recession or whatever. That, that looks so impressive and it makes our life easier, which is always a good thing. Um, I haven't actually seen anyone do that yet. I've not had a single... Uh, <laughs> potential investment come to me with a proper model and I'm amazed that they're not doing it and so Andy you can you can advise all of your <laughs> customers uh, to do that going forward because I think I think they're missing a trick yeah no absolutely and I think the other bit also and I think you touched on it at the start Amy is get advice there are lots of really good m a lawyers who are there and who are willing to advise small businesses and the truth is most of these conversations i'm not putting you guys in a corner um but most that first conversation you can have for free um, because they will only get paid when they are actually doing work and generating value for you so don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call them um, so let me I, I think we've gone through most of these questions and i'm scrambling to look around to see what else i have um, 
So just here, so we haven't talked very much about, I'm just going to put the two out there that I want to talk about. I want to talk about sort of more in the distress area because we've been talking about great things, but if I'm, if I'm stuck and I really need cash to get out, what are my options? Um, and so who has more appetite for higher risk businesses? And then the other bit also is maybe we can then touch on government finance. And I know that there's a lot that's been talked about, but if we can just pause on that, because I think we had a question from that. But let's talk high risk distress financing options. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> um, oh, goodness. <laughs> I can, I, can talk, I, can talk, I can talk a little bit about it. I, yeah, I, I'm not, not an expert in, uh, in distressed businesses, but yeah. you know, it's, it's the same as anything. There are, there are debt and equity options which specialise um, towards distressed. I touched upon it earlier. Um, you know, ev everything with pricing, whether it's equity or, or debt, is, is risk-based. And therefore, you know, when you get to that end, it's, it's going to cost you more. So there are some specific funds out there who will um buy up distressed businesses um uh, there's there's a couple as our capital root capital um as a as a couple of names um you know one of those focuses um very much on uh venture capital investments that haven't gone to plan but might still be you know underlying okay underlying okay businesses but haven't got um uh you know necessarily the traction they they wanted the other one, if I'm being honest, most of the time we'll we'll buy up a business for not very much money at all, might be a pound or something. But what they'll do as part of that is they'll take all the debt and the and, and the need to go through a, a formal process off the off the hands of the business and try and turn it around. Um, so there are there are options. Um, something we were talking about yesterday there is um, you know, probably one of the first points of call is um, the same as we were talking about general advisors if you're looking to raise money or, or take debt or something like that go and talk to a restructuring specialist early and do that as early as possible because a lot of the problems we see with clients who come to us too late and it's to say it's a case of if they've gone and spoken to somebody earlier there were more mild steps that have been taken and they've left themselves very few options so you know don't be scared doesn't mean you fail to go and talk to somebody because actually you can rescue the business before even any formal action needs to be taken um you know, when you start getting on the formal spectrum, it, again, it's a spectrum. There are things like um, CBAs, which are credit of voluntary arrangements. Um, those are where you go with a formal legal deal with all your creditors about how much and when you'll pay them. Yeah. That so means people can't come and chase you on that. And it obviously goes, does go all the way through to things like administration. But if you speak to people earlier, you've got, the more, you've got a much better chance of doing the more, more mild forms of things, which actually mean you can hopefully trade out of it and, and the business can come out the other side. So I would say, go and talk to people um, as early as possible. Um, you know, there are specialists out there, a lot of the, the, we don't do it in our accounting firms, but accounting firms, or there are specialist firms that people like FRP, for example, is one of them that, that spoke, focus specifically on um, insolvency cases. Fabulous, thank you. Um, just, just briefly, uh, to, I think, for early stage businesses, uh, if you do run into trouble, a, a couple of scenarios that we see play out quite a lot is you know, either a new equity funding round at quite a discount that wipes out a lot of your existing investors or massively dilutes them, or if, if things are, are kind of really even worse than that, you know, potentially prepack administrations where the business is sold to a new entity as a method of of leaving some of the debts behind, uh, but possibly with some, some new incentives in there uh, for the founders and with a new financial backer. Very good, very good. Um, thank you all. I certainly have learned a lot from this conversation. Um, and we're now, it's 11.57. Um, like I, I had said something on government back financing. I think it would just be nice to sort of get your closing notes quickly and if there are any final nuggets that you would just like to leave us with, um, that would be fantastic. So um, maybe we just go in the order we started. Andy, do you want to just... Yeah, I, so I suppose I'd actually just echo what I said at the beginning, which is um, while there's been a shock to everyone, actually the, the view we're trying to take is one of being positive. And, and very much looking, you know, encouraging everyone to look to the, for the future and take advantage of opportunities. You know, 
it's not something directly in the beauty space, but to give you a couple of examples, I've, I've seen, I've seen, um, we've got a, a wine business, which usually sold a lot of, um, of its through to catering and events, which aren't happening right now. Um, and they've switched, they've set up a, an e-com site and they're now trying to sell through e-com. Now, are they going to be as successful as somebody who's already got the, probably not, but it's still coming back to what I've said before, a channel that you can do. So very much consider what are the opportunities you can you can take advantage of. Amy mentioned some other other things from a marketing perspective that could be done, but very much use this time, um, even if you're not able to sell much stock, to think how can you make yourself stronger from a from a position um, going forward. So I'd say keep your eye on the future and, and try and be positive as much as possible. <laughs> Amy, it's important. Um. Um, I'll be the, the cynical, uh, <laughs> I'll be private equity person. Uh, you should all be running a 13 week cash flow. Cash is king, absolutely at this time. Longer than 13 weeks if you can. Hoard all your cash. You'd rather have it on your balance sheet than sat in someone else's balance sheet where you're having to ask nicely if they could send it to you, please, because they owe it to you. Um, if you can get yourself into a position where you can survive for a year with the cash you've got, that's, I think, which, what should be your target at the moment because nobody has a clue what is going to happen on how to get out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, point two, I think, it's a bit more cheerful. Be nice to your employees, be nice to your staff, uh, you know, buying them whatever it is, chocolate, drinks, anything to make them a little bit happier. Everyone's having a really shit time. Um, some people are obviously trapped at home with nightmare children and all the rest of it. Luckily, it's not me. Um, but I think little things really do help, especially when everyone's having to take really major lifestyle changes that are forced on them. And then lastly, get advice. If there's something you don't know, you're confused about, you're wondering if there's an opportunity um, <laughs> without trying to talk Andy out of a fee. There are lots of corporate finance people out there who will happily chat to you because it could turn into a fee down the line. No one bites. Everyone's very friendly. Um, and professional advice will, will and can save you a shed load of money down the line. So I'd strongly, strongly suggest you get some. Very good. Thank you. And, and David? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd echo what Andy and Amy have said. You know, hunker down. To some extent, you need to be in survival mode, reducing costs where you can, getting cash in, and then thinking about the opportunities that are going to arise when you know, we start to recover and we are going to recover you know your a lot of your competitors will have gone out of business and that'll be you know automatically an, an advantage for you and if you do have supportive investors who will fund growth and fund acquisitions there are going to be some very good businesses some very good assets available at very attractive prices just because they've run out of cash uh, and if, if you're the last business standing and able to take advantage of those you know that's a great position to be in Thank you all so much. It's been incredibly valuable. Um, I think the only final thing I will add to those closing notes that I've heard is also in the power of networking. You know, buddies like CW exist for this. We're all in this whole, um, we're all in this together and just being able to access other beauty brand owners and ask the question, what are you doing? is so important. So a little Plug here and Sally and her team I know are thinking about what actually other businesses need, what kind of support they need. So now's the right time to be getting that membership. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for your time. Um, all of, I think in the actual PR and promo that's gone out, the full names of each of our panelists is on there. You can look them up online through their businesses. I think most businesses are open and also on LinkedIn. Um, and you also have my details. Thank you all very much. I'm just looking at q and I think we've picked up on everything. We're out of time anyway. Thanks and thank you to everybody who's joined us for participating. I hope that you've had something out of this. I certainly have.